Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dark Phoenix Gaming, and welcome back to season two of my let's play of Elder Kings 2 as the Empire of Cyrodiil. Now, this is just the introductory video where we're sort of going to be going over where things stood at the end of Season 1. Because it has been a couple of months since I put up the last video, I think. Something along those lines, anyways. It's been a while since I put up the last video, so... I wouldn't be surprised if people did not remember the exact details. Actually, that's a little bit off. It's been just under a month, because the series I did in the interim was a little shorter than I expected. That being my Raiders of Gotland series, which is just recently finished and is what this is replacing. So what we're going to do in this introductory video is I'm going to go over some stuff and just look around the map so we can get an idea of how things stand in the various corners of the world as well as just see what sort of expansion opportunities there are for us so this area over here i know absolutely nothing about so i couldn't tell you how it's changed from the start of the game Eleanor at the start and Eleanor right now are basically identical. I think there are some goblins or something that have a couple of little provinces in Eleanor when you start. That's about the only difference I can see. Valenwood, I believe they've been a little bit more consolidated. There's definitely fewer kingdoms than there are at the start. Because there's uh, f four major ones and a couple of little tiny ones being slowly gobbled up right now. Is how Valenwood stands right now. Elsewhere seen the biggest difference. I'm pretty sure these guys in Dunai were around at their current borders at game start, but elsewhere at the beginning, while they were the biggest and most significant of the Khajiit kingdoms, and they were an empire tier high king title at the time. there were a significant number of other kingdoms that had stuck around. Elsewhere has, over the course of this campaign, managed to conquer all of them. Which means, as far as the Khajiit are concerned, they're the only ones we'll have to deal with. There's a couple of minor people around here that we're going to have to deal with as well. The Topol Corsairs, they held... It was Deep Scorn Hollow, that's right. They held Deep Scorn Hollow. We, When we finally managed to crawl our way south and incorporate Leowen, that was part of Leowen, so we took it from them, but... We just sort of left them alone on their little island after we did that. Then we come to Black Marsh, which is going to be the place we're probably going to be targeting first. Just because it's closest and also we have a province of Black Marsh already under our control. 
the Duchy of Gideon here. They agreed to become our vassal. And Gideon... Is de jure part of the High Kingdom of Black Marsh? Given that, Black Marsh would seem like a sensible first target. And once again, like with a lot of these places, I don't know what it looked like at the start of the campaign, so I cannot tell you how things have changed. Then we come to Morrowind, which is rather different from how it is in Crusader Kings 2's Elder Kings mod, I can tell you. Because CK2 Elder Kings Morrowind is all nominally under the Tribunal Temple. Just all the different houses are tributaries of them. That said, I think some of the... And I don't think there were any independent tribes in that version. They existed, but as vassals to the various houses. As to how things look in this compared to the start, there might have been some minor border shifts, I'm not really sure, but generally everyone has about the same territory they did when I last looked. Although, and I could be wrong, the Urshalaku tribe may have expanded a little bit. I'm not totally sure. But, it's quite possible. Skyrim is next, and they are a hot mess. For the most part. The Rift is currently having a war. Let's see, they're defending... Oh, that's the King of the Rift. Uh, uh, this is kind of funny. King Orgnolf II of the Rift is at war with his wife. Who is the ruler of Snowhold, Crystal Drift, and Lurgroft. It's a tyranny rebellion war, basically. So. He's trying to imprison her, and she revolted. And if she wins, he'll be deposed, and he's currently losing. That's kind of interesting. Smoke Frost, you know, that hold is independent. It's du jour part of the rift, but I think they seceded at some point. And with Nimolton here. Is both one an independent tribe and two is actually run by the Reach folk. So if you've played Skyrim, that's basically the Forsworn. Falkranth, which is basically identical to how it was at the start of the game, is an orc kingdom. Located where Falkreath is. 
Which is just hilarious to me that a tribe of orcs has managed to take over one of Skyrim's holds. White Run has definitely expanded a good bit. Managed to take over a couple of holds nearby. Anvilsund here is independent of Eastern Skyrim. They must have seceded at one point or another because they've definitely. That was definitely part of Eastern Skyrim at the start of the game. Making of Eastern Skyrim. It's now ruled by High King Ragnavar and is in a civil war. Uh, it's again a tyranny war, but this guy's winning said tyranny war. Then there's Winterhold. I think their borders are similar, but I don't know if they're the same. Fellhammer. Then we have Solsheim, which is sitting here doing fuck all, as it was at the start of the game. And if you move over a little bit, we have Hjalmarch. Drachikmir. And... And... Uh, Hafengar. You may be noticing something that's conspicuously absent here. That being, there is no Kingdom of Western Skyrim. You see, Eastern Skyrim and Western Skyrim are what you'd refer to in Crusader Kings 2 as titular titles, so the title itself does not ha technically have any de jure vassals. At least, I believe that's how it works. And they have to hold the titles for time to get them to be de jure under it. This has de jure titles under it because they've existed by default for a while. At the start of the game, but at one point Western Skyrim just collapsed. Mm. A bunch of its bits and pieces are completely independent, and Markarth is also ruled by the Reach Folk, which it wasn't at the start of the game. It was ruled by Nords. Then from there, we can move over to High Rock, which is a good deal less splintered than in the lore. The kingdoms of Evermore, Wayrest, and Daggerfall all have significant amounts of territory, and Shornhelm isn't doing bad for itself either. But if I had to put money on any of these kingdoms unifying Daggerfall under, or unifying High Rock rather, under their banner, it would definitely be Daggerfall because they are doing the best right now. Now let's move over to Hammerfell, which at this moment in time, there actually is no kingdom of Hammerfell. It just does not exist. It did. I believe it existed at the start of the game. No, wait, that was in the previous start date. I don't know if there's a kingdom of Hammerfell by default in this interregnum start date though. No, basically around where Higathe 
Loyon and Sentinel is right now was controlled by the Kingdom of Hammerfell at the start. But in the pre interregnum start date. But yeah. All of this is Hammerfell. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the world. Given we've looked at the world, I think it's time we move on and have a look at Marius, Emperor Marius the Great. And refresh everyone about where we are. So, we have alliances with a couple of our vassals. And us getting control of Cyrodiil was a mix of peaceful expansion and stabbing people with pointy sticks. The Jarl of Bruma here, actually, to get him to become our vassal, we married our daughter to him. So he is technically our son-in-law. And we have three children. Let's clear that up. Our daughter Sabrina is married to the Jarl of Bruma. She is 22. Probably not too happy to be married to someone who's nearly double her age, but hey, politics. Then there is our son Riemann, who is the husband of the Countess of Coral. Now, this involves some convoluted nonsense that we he did at one point. Basically, if you recall, because of the way alliances work in Crusader Kings 2. I had an alliance formed with the Colovian Estates, which were over in this region. And because it was formed by marriage, we couldn't break that alliance, meaning I couldn't invade them to unify Cyrodiil. So I had to use console commands to get that land under my control. But because uh, the Countess here really liked us, her being our daughter-in-law among other things, and we really liked her, we wanted her to be a vassal under us, so the way I sort of justify it in-universe is to say that in exchange for swearing fealty, she didn't get to keep all of the territory that the Colovian estates had accumulated. But we would give her the Imperial County of Coral and she could be the Count. Despite the fact that means that its capital is not Coral. And it's not ruled from the Viscounty of Coral. We made an exception to our organizational strategy for our daughter-in-law. Now, uh, we have plenty of situation stuff we could look at, but I'm gonna do that another time. And we do need to hold court because it's been a while since we've done that.
see. We have an ongoing scheme to sway this guy who already likes us, so... I will abandon that scheme. We can get another scheme in place when we start the official gameplay. But now... I'm going to open up our lifestyle. We finished the strategist and overseer path. Given Marius' character, we have zero interest in plunderer. And to be honest, we're more of a leader type military commander than fight from the front type knight or whatever you want to call it. So, gallant doesn't make sense. As such, we've kind of exhausted every reason we have to keep doing the martial tree. So, I'm going to switch us over to diplomacy. This path, as it happens, has a number of things on it that we want to have access to because they'd be so beneficial to us. In the Diplomat and August paths, to be precise. There are, in fact, two that we especially want. It's being Ducal Conquest. Which I presume lets us conquer duchies. And Forced vassalage will allow us to forcibly vassalize. Is any ruler that does not have more than three counties in their realm, which will let us speed up our expansion significantly. And I am going to give us the focus of majesty. Regality flows from ritual, tradition, and glory. Which will give us one more diplomacy, not that we really need it, and one more prestige every month, as well as the 31 diplomacy experience we get. Can only be changed every five years. get our next perk. Meantime, we'll just expand, 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 conquer, conquer, conquer. As I've said, our two most immediate targets we'll be going after right off the bat will be Black Marsh and Hammerfell. So it's the weakest and the easiest to hit up. But that will be it for this introductory video. Thank you for watching and 
Welcome back to Elder Kings 2. I hope you enjoy this continuation series. See you next time for when we pick up for real. See you then, folks. See you then.